Greetings, my fellow Freedom Lovers and Sovereign Thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful swampy mangroves of South Florida. And today's date, Wednesday, April 6, 2016. Yep, I know it's been a while since we did the last podcast. But I just had to make a living, had a really crazy schedule. I'm itching to do another show. So thank you for your patience. And uh, I always... uh been checking out my um, statistics and status statistics on the people who are listening from other countries like folks from China, France, Belgium, Morocco, and many others in France as well. I thank everyone for checking it out. Hopefully you should do downloading and sharing the information wherever you go. Post it on your pages. It doesn't matter because I'm not here to do it for the money whatsoever. It's just putting the message out, try to keep it honorable and unfiltered the best I can. Like we said, we all have our moments. I admit my errors. Sometimes I try to use certain language that's inappropriate, which is no um, intent whatsoever. But I just like to, you know, just have to put that out there first. And I like to, you know, just one thing I can't stand the most. When you try to do things and so forth, and you got a bunch of drama queens and want to be nannies and consultant buffoons trying to tell everyone how to live, how to clean your own rectum, but they can't even take the initiative to do it on their own. Doesn't matter if it's federal, state, local, or in the little minions out there. This, is, this time I do call them out. I don't like using the, some certain language to try to be a gentleman and they give me gar- they try to treat me like a piece of garbage and I just blast them. You know why? Because that's what the only exhibition they can comprehend. And it's horrible and disturbing. And I did put people in their places without being violent or making any threats. So it's just one of those days that it does happen. If you're going to violate my space or try to come into my property without my authorization, you can may face consequences, Lord willing. I don't, hopefully it never occurs, but that has happened before. I know it happened to many people out there in the country and the world when you got these governmental buffoons, Uncle Tom's and Angel Mama, they go all, all high and mighty because they have a badge and they sell their souls. I'm not saying all of them are wicked, but you just get those handful. And like I said, natural law is a higher, higher, has a higher standard than that. You respect people. You don't insult them. And that's what things are happening right now. People are waking up wherever I go. I chat with. And people, even uh, parts of the world, they send me stuff. And I thank them dearly on that. And, uh, of course, I get my comments and criticisms, on, you know, on YouTube, which is fine. I expect that as well. It doesn't bother me one bit. And, like, as long as we do it in good faith. That's how he is. How to better ourselves and each other. Honorable discussions has always been a key role in life. Instead of mudslinging and telling them you're an effing a-hole or a piece of garbage. And it's so morose when you derm these folks trying to use that to gain or be, make it beneficial for themselves. In the long run, it will blow back in your faces when least expect it. But please, show some dignity to one another. It will have, be a lot better. It may not be perfect. We could make it ourselves a lot better and spread that love and integrity. So uh, I still have to make my little rant on that because it did happen to me this past week. Someone tried to violate my space and um, I had to call him out on it. But got ironed out pretty quick. So um, it's one of those things, one of those days. But. Sometimes you just got to do it, you know, just, like I said, you can't be, always be a good teacher. Go, okay, sir, okay, boss, because why be a peasant? We have the powers in ourselves can make spiritual improvements and stand on principles. This is what I do. Sometimes, like I said before, I know I'm, I'm digressing, have those moments, but it's always been on that perspective. So I'm um, just going to do some interesting articles. I'm going to read 
Some of it's pretty interesting. And um, we'll just check it out, shall we? Of course, I'm going to play another song as well after this. Yeah, this came out from LouRockwell.com. That's just by Roger Stone. And uh, an interesting little commentary is uh, called here, Next from the Bush Crime Family. And Roger Stone wrote this. It came out today, by the way. It says here, the story of the Bush crime family doesn't end with good old Jeb Bush. In fact, that there seems to be an inheritance of elitism and criminality in the son of Jeb. That could be the title of a horror movie, and it would be better if it were. Alas, alas, the truth is always darker, especially when digging around the Bush family. I mean, of course, Jim P. Bush. The P stands for Prescott. Yes. Jorge P. I have to say Jorge P. His name after his grandfather, Senator Prescott Bush, who made a family fortune financing the Nazi war machine and whose Union Bank was seized by the Roosevelt administration for treasonous activity in 1942. I lay this in my book, Jeb and the Bush Crime Family. Yes, and there was an investigative reporter who talked about that. I may have to get... um. Try to try to get that link in there too as soon as as soon as possible. Try to add this to the memo because this guy was very meritable. I've got the person's name and I should smack myself upside the head on it. I, I learned about this 12 years ago about the Bush crime family, like more further details. So um, I'm gonna continue on. I looked up Jorge P in Wikipedia. Born in Houston, Texas in 1976, he attended Gulliver Prep School and earned an undergraduate degree from Rice University. In 1990, he became a public school teacher in Florida and later went to law school in Texas. Another lawyer who was very corrupt, I would say. In 2007, the United, the United States Navy Reserve announced the selection of Bush for training as an intelligence officer. He served for eight months in operation during freedom and returned to the U.S. in 2011. Yes, all hail to the empire. In 2012, he announced his intentions to run for state office. By January 2013, Bush filed a campaign finance report stating that he received $1.3 million in contributions. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> Where is the money? Where is the money? This was due to his father, former governor, and wannabe president Jeb's massive email campaign. Yes, the Bush privileges keep on rolling. It seems Jeb sent out emails requesting that donors support and donate to young Jorge P. in his bid for Texas land commissioner. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, let the good times, let the crime, criminal times roll, right? And by, Ju by June 2013, Bush has raised $3.3 million. I guess bothers Bush's email campaign worked. Who would think of turning down Jeb Bush? There was no Democratic candidate running against him, and a barely Republican opponent, David Watts. I would say that $3.3 million was enough to win him the election. Woo, man. <laughs> he better off just keeping that and just and, 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 and running for that pathetic office, I would say. What's missing from the Wikipedia story so far is a little item that what happened when Jorge P. was attending Rice University. In 1994, Jorge P. was investigated for burglary and criminal mischief related to an attempt, attempted break-in in his, at his home of his ex-girlfriend, Christina Cohen. According to Miami-Dade Police Department reports, at 4 a.m., a neighbor saw a half-naked man trying to pry open a window at the Cohen residence. An argument ensued and awoke Mr. Cohen. The window was to the bedroom of his daughter, Christina. In a mad dash to escape, Jorge P., Pan, ran and jumped into his vehicle and fled. 20 minutes later, he returned and drove his car across the Cohen yard, damaging about 80 feet of pristine lawn. The police had been called, and they were when they arrived, they identified Jorge Prescott Bush as the perpetrator. Young Christina told the police that Jorge P. had been stalking and harassing her since she broke up with him almost two years ago. Although he should have been arrested immediately, and he was not. So, Kathy Rundle, can you ex explain that to me? The DA that wants to fight crime? Uh, is, it, is it true that, is it possible that Jorge and your twin boys make love together and all have his and his, his towels? Something to think about. Pure hypocrisy at its best. And I'm not, I won't be surprised if Kathy Fernandez Rundle, the DA from Miami-Dade, uh, Miami Day County, who was the assistant to who? Janet Reno had knowledge of this and didn't do a damn thing. This is what happens when you have glamour people in power. I will continue.
in a suspicious turn of events that Cohen's elected not file charges and even signed a non-prosecution form. Did Daddy Bush have persuaded the Cohen's that it would be in their best interest to let the matter rest? Was there an out-of-court settlement? George Jorge's Prescott record as Texas Land Commissioner has come under well-deserved scrutiny. Texas taxpayers pay Jorge P. a salary of $137,500 a year to run the general Texas General Land Office. According to the Houston Chronicle, Jorge P. missed nearly half his work days while his father was campaigning for the GOP nomination. In addition, the Chronicle revealed that Jorge P. had dramatically remade the GLO by outstanding a majority of his longtime leaders and replacing many of them with people with ties to his campaign and family. Former Land Commissioner Jerry P- Patterson said that the firings represented a purge of the best agencies in Texas government and a purge of people who have done wonderful things. Although a Bush spokesman denied the allegations, a list provided by the GLO themselves tells the truth. This contains the names of at least 20 persons hired with connections to George Prescott's Jorge, Jorge Prescott's campaign, his law school, or his family. In other recent Bush events, the Texas Land Commissioner is joining a lawsuit against the Bureau of Land Management. It seems, according to Bush, that the government is wrongfully claiming that a certain 113-acre track along the Red River is public land. Bush contends that it is owned by private landowners. Their boundaries fluctuated. fluctuate according to the changing courses of the river. Bush stated whether it's the EPA, the BLM, or the Endangered Species Act, they believe bureaucrats know better than landowners. Now they're messing with Texas. The matter has not yet been resolved. Well, 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 could we say, is this a, a dog and pony show in that last uh, state, last paragraph? I wouldn't be surprised, but we all know about little Jorge himself has sold himself to the New World Order family. It's too obvious. And I've seen him. I remember he did spoke about his, I remember him, he did spoke about, if I'm correct, his campaign for his grandfather. Okay, the, the 1992 Republican Convention, a little kid, Viva Bush, Viva Bush, you don't know one knows him, but no one really knows him but us. He's a great man, Viva Bush. Okay, in addition, I was I, mean, I, do, I do recall going, attending the um, the announcement his father, his daddy made, John Ellis Bush, at the um, Miami Dade Community College South Kent, um, Kendall campus, stating that he talked about his his father would be a, he's a, was a great governor, he could be a great president. What? Read all the teleprompter as usual. What's his glamorous look? You know, the Chicano look. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna go degrading him or anything, but he had that little pretty boy look, like the political version of Ricky Martin. Ole, ole, ole. You know, one of those. Like, it's like if ever to do a, a movie, a, a movie of Menudo, he'll be the perfect. He'll be on there the perfect role. So just, just look, just think about. It. Just look at his photos, watch his videos. You understand what I'm talking about. And it's a real shame, my friends. We have to be vigilant. Honest. If Jorge Prescott Bush runs to run for governor or, pr- or president of the United States or vice president, we got to put his behind into, onto the fire and say, butt out, contaminate space somewhere else. Because one thing for sure, he's just like it, like father, like son, like grandfather, like father, like son. A pure example of the yippee, yappy, yahooey generation, which is the Bush family, part of the alleged Windsor bloodline. Something to really think about. And this is why I was enjoying myself when Jeb Bush was embarrassed by Donald Trump. And I'm not making Donald Trump as my Lord and Savior and not going to make those statements. Uh, better be authentic when he when he said it at a debate that your grandfather was, and the Bush family was involved with the Nazi and 9-11 connections. And Joseph Ellis, Joe Ellis, didn't say a word, couldn't refute it because Mr. Trump was right. And that's been in the books, by investigative reporters. And I learned about this good 12 years and I'm laughing at him. People are really waking up, my friends. 
and hopefully you keep the, the, the engine, you keep the movement going. What's happening right now is just another example of one tyrant falls, another one will arrive. That's how you have to look at it. That's what preserving freedom is. Jefferson said the best. When the when the people fear the government, it's tyranny. When the government fears people, it's freedom. It doesn't matter where you live, who you are, what your gender is, what your views are, what your skin color is, etc. We're all capable of being freedom-loving, sovereign-thinking, beautiful individuals. That's how I see things. I've been doing this for a good long time. Even though I've been podcasting, you know, for a couple years, almost two years, two, almost two years now, a little two and a half years now. I'm getting better at it. I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to be filtered either, or be Mr. Squeaky Clean. All right, but um, definitely got to always stay on these bastards' toes. Don't be afraid of them. But the bottom line is this. They need you more you need them. I know I've been saying, harping that periodically on my show. But you have to really exercise it. For your rights are natural born. Jorge Prescott Bush is another, another example of he sold his soul to the One World Order. He, probably, he was raised in that environment. So he's been programmed. We've all been programmed when we're there. We've all been swindled. And the sad thing is, he's, he's, getting, he's getting screwed too in the long run. I'm not condemning the man, but it's some of his actions I have to not endorse. So, next one here came from The Intercept. And it came out today by Jenna McLaughlin. It says here, LA activists want to bring surveillance conversation down to earth. And as it reads here, government surveillance is not an abstract thing, says Hamid Khan. Coordination for the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition for the commu- for the communities Khan works with the works it works with in Los Angeles. And we got a ambulance come going through and a fire truck coming through. All right, wherever you do, folks. Ho- hopefully, hopefully not going after a dog. All right. For the communities, Khan works with, works with, works with in Los Angeles, from transgender people to recipients of government benefits to the homeless on Skid Row. Surveillance is the daily reality that impacts their lives and exacerbates of other societal ills like mass incarceration and police violence. Khan's coalition works to track, publicize, and ultimately dismantle the highly intrusive ways the Los Angeles Police Department surveils. Sur- 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 the area's citizens using an infrastructure of advanced intelligence gathering linked to government counterism counterterrorism initiatives. The LAPD uses big data for predictive policing, street cameras with highly accurate facial recognition capabilities, stingrays, and DRT boxes, which imitate imitate cell phone towers to track nearby phones or jam signals, automatic plate readers, body cameras, and drones. Come on. 1984. Do, 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 do. Exactly. How many different ways? How many different ways our bodies are being constantly tracked, traced, and monitored? Not just online. Khan asked in a phone interview. Khan, originally from Pakistan, will be speaking at much anticipated Georgetown University Center on Privacy and Technology Conference on Friday, devoted to color of surveillance, government monitoring of the black community. There's a link on that too, so check it out, folks. The Stop LAPD Spying Coalition has already been around for two years before the world learned about Edward Snowden, his trove of documents about NSA spying operations, Khan said. It started in the summer of 2011 when the coalition started in inviting different groups of people to meet and talk about what surveillance and being a suspect meant to them. Meetings like that still takes place every first Monday of the month. In March 2013, the coalition published a People's Audit of the Los Angeles Police Department's Information Sharing Suspicions, Activity Reporting, and Predictive Policing Tactics, the first of three reports. And it's true because it's under the Public Information Act of California. Exercise it there, the Golden State. 
Don't make a police state. Exercise as the golden state. Do not be t- taken advantage of. And the folks here in Los Angeles are doing a great job at it. So take advantage of it. Exercise it. Plus, do not be your a number to these bastards. And I will proceed. The group has since published a diagram of the entire visible architect of surveillance in L.A., which they said is driven by a hunger of data, aggressive and predictive policing, and corrupt corporate profit from surveillance technology. Could we say the word fascism? Whether you are in a public park picked up on a video camera, tracked through the use of the electronic benefit transfer card at the grocery store, or someone reports you for some vague suspicious activities without any evidence, the regime of total monitoring takes shape, Khan explained. See? Suspicious activities. Drama queens are the drama queens. Someone's in there. I don't know what they're doing. But looks like they're... Yeah, drama queens. Because they have no life. That's how pathetic some of these people are. And I will continue. Many of, many of the policies adopted in L.A., he said, were originally developed to fight terrorism overseas, including predictive policing methods first funded by the U.S. military to track insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan, now becoming part of a local policing con said coalition discovered that the national suspicious activities report initiative launched in 2008 gives LAPD license to write up secret files on individuals based on speculation and hunches kind of sort of it's the only way kind of sort of will get us through the day the group learned from the LAPD inspector general report in 2014 that over 30 percent of these reports were written about black people in LA where less than 10 percent of the entire population is black wow they got straight skin color attack profile attack attack get them get them get them that's how they that's how these people want to think mind control 101 Khan says the LAPD argued those numbers weren't troubling because the number of the reports overall wasn't that large, but the group argues it's still disappropriate. A proportionate, excuse me. And according to the Intelligence Gathering's guidelines published in 2012, the FBI can embed informants in political groups' advocacy meetings for up to six months based on a tip alone or initial lead. Yes, I can tell the government that you are criticizing them because I got to make my money and I spread my butt cheeks to get those benefits. I'm just being sarcastic. I'm sorry. Technology is a big part of the persuasiveness concept. The surveillance has always been there, but the rate of technology and information sharing has outpaced what's reasonable. Sometimes surveillance and harassment are essentially essentially one and the same. One man featured in a video group produced explained that police officers were lingered nearby Skid Row and wait for people to leave for a few minutes, then seize their property as if it was abandoned. Currently, the group is investigating the practice of surveillance of public benefit programs involving the Department of Children and Family Services, conducting interviews with people who receive public benefits and submitting Freedom of Information Act requests for information to determine the extent of the monitoring and how might affect particularly homeless and poor people. Uh Uh-huh, exactly. Let's get them. We'll use them as numbers. The group is also trying to learn about the LAPD's predictive policing and information using to inform the algorithms to determine what factors indicate police that certain neighborhood or persons might become dangerous. Yeah. That's just the spy. Do, 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 spy versus spy. Besides actively changing, challenging surveillance tactics employed by local police, Khan says the group wants to desensationalize the language of surveillance. We want to bring it down, bring it down to every day, 24/7. He told me over the phone because for many in LA, privacy is not a right but a privilege. He said, "Really? Well, you know what? Those people there, they can stick it up their rectum." To say, stick it up their rectum, as far as I'm concerned, because they're nothing more than a bunch of bend over bobs and angel mamas to the state. All right, most people he works with, he said, don't care about much about encryption, encryption, because physical privacy alone is far out of reach. So, gotta give Mr. Khan credit for making this happen. They're taking the initiative. They're he's doing they're doing something what's right, fighting this thing okay on pri- fighting the government against privacy and people in los angeles should support this pr- individual hit the link stop lapd spying coalition because this is part of the one world order propaganda you know, 
They want to train us like little boys and girls, hold hands. If we criticize, they want to use call us thought criminals. Yes, I I know some of those bastards like that mind with that mindset that want to bend over for the state. Probably think I'm a thought criminal. You know what? And I don't really give a damn what you think of me. Okay, so this is how you have to look at look at these people. And the, I tell this to a lot of folks. The, okay, we got a fire truck coming in. Maybe going around. Yeah, but possibly maybe going around. Oops, I gotta zip my pants here. So, um, so you gotta support these guys, support this person, support their cause, and it should be happening everywhere within the United States and the world, okay, and around the world. And I know there's a lot of uprising that's happening across the globe, and including the United States on different avenues. And you gotta keep the go- keep the momentum going. So give them a thumbs up. All right, you tell him, look at the third, Mr. Khan. Thank you for having the, the guts to go out there and make things work because action speaks louder than words. And to all those folks out there, if you complain, don't do anything, you need to shut up. Plain and simple. And then just break down the police state. De- put dents in them little by little until they're smashed into oblivion. All right, next thing here. It's on Yahoo. Of course, everyone's talking about the whole Panama Papers. All these big fancy condos and luxurious pigeonholes you see all over the certain town, east, east coast of the towns, including Miami, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, even areas in Salt Lake City, Utah, and, and New York. They made these big luxurious pigeonholes. And there's no one living in it. Why? I say squat. Put them in squat. But this is interesting here. It's um because here Panama Papers revealed London as center of the spider's web. And um as it reads here from the AFP, it says that as well as a shiny spotlight on the secret financial arrangement of the rich and the powerful, the so-called Panama Papers have laid bare London's row as a vital organ of the world's tax haven network. The file leak from Panama law firm Mossack Forsake. Fonseca exposed Britain's links to thousands of firms based in tax havens and how secret money is invested in British assets, particularly London property. Critics accused British authorities of turning a blind eye to the inflow of suspect money and being too close to the financial sector to clamp down on the use of its overseas territories as havens, with the British Virgin Islands alone hosting 110,000 of the most sack Fonseca's clients. London is the epic center of so much of the sleaze that's happening in the world. Nicholas Shaxton, author of the book Treasure Island, which examines the role of offshore banks and tax havens, told AFP. The political analyst said that Britain itself was relatively transparent and clean, but that companies use the country's territories abroad. Rugs the day of empire to farm out the seedier, seedier stuff, often the guise of the shell companies with anonymous owners. Tax evasions and stuff like that will be done in the external part of the network. Usually there'll be links to the City of London, UK law firms, UK accountant firms, and U- to UK banks. He said, calling London the center of a spider's web. They're all agents of the City of London that where the whole exercise is controlled from. Richard Murphy, a professor at London City University, said the offshore havens, capital of funny money, the files shown that Britain had the third highest number of Mossack Fonseca's middlemen operating within its borders with 32,682 advisors. Good grief. Although not illegal in themselves, shell companies can be used for illegal activities such as laundering the proceeds of criminal activities or to conceal misappropriate or politically inconvenient wealth. Around 310,000 tax haven companies owned an estimate of 70, pounds, 70 billion pounds or 200 billion euros or 240 billion dollars of British real estate, 10% of which were linked to Mossack Fonseca. The files appear to show that the United Arab Emirates president, Shakif Khalifa, Khalifa bin Zaidi al Nayan, owned London properties worth more than 1.2 billion pounds, and that Maryam Safdar, daughter of Pakistani new Prime Minister Nawaz Sarif, Sharif was the beneficial owner of two offshore companies that owned flat on the exclusive parks lane, exclusive park lane. The revelations undermined promises of 
by British Prime Minister David Cameron to clear up the murky world of offshore finance. And it proceeds. Every few years, London pretends to clean up its act, wrote columnist Simon Jenkins in the Capitol's Evening Standard newspaper. Most of the world cities are ruthless against foreigners who arrive with suitcases of cash to buy property or other businesses. Not London, he added. It was an awash. It is a wash in offshore towers overlooking the Thames. Conspicuous displays of foreign wealth are common around the British capital from the lavish statues outside the mansions of the Russian oligarchs to the fleet of Lamborghinis raced by Middle Eastern princelings around the streets of plush night bridges. London's reputation as the capital of funny money, so-called by Jenkins, is closely related to its legitimate attraction as a financial center with its light touch regulation by Z. Fari attitudes towards wealth, vibrant culture, and history of global trading, says Shaxton. Wild animals. London has a crossroad for world's money for centuries. Can we say the Bank of England? Oh, he explained. When the British Empire collapsed, London swapped being the governor of the Imperial Engine to being an offshore island and allowing money to come with no question asked, he added. With public pressure mounting, Murphy said... Britain had the power to legislate directly on its overseas territory, but the lobbying power of the financial sector and words about upsetting the jewel in Britain's economic crown were holding back efforts. The city of London seems to believe that without these conduits, then it would not have the competitive edge that it needs, he said. The financial institution had become like wild animals, he had at Shaxton. It's the government's responsibility to stop this nonsense. The government has been captured by the banking establishment and some way has to be found for found for that has that to be broken british politicians feel they can't do anything well when you have the rothschilds running the financial world we're a bunch of peasants and the politicians in england didn't figure that one out come on give me a break and i'll say uh, many of us uh, many of us are, are saying this which i have to agree respectfully the ones who may get popped will be the patsies they say, hey, let's get this queen clink out. He's pathetic. Let's get this bimbo out. She sucks. Boom. You gotta just, just use them as fuck. You gotta just pluck them away. Like they're like like flies. Fly squat. Boom, boom. They whack them. That's it. Done. They're expendable. That's what we're gonna see right now. But a good thing about one thing about it, it's interesting. How how deep does this thing go? I know many people on activist posts and and uh, maybe uh, I will say um, truth frequency. Because we want accurate information. The one thing we gotta look out for too is a distraction. That's one thing for sure. But little thing I, I'm I like things are popping out, man, coming out of the woodwork. So I got I read about the Miami New Time and the Miami connection. Downtown Miami, go down to Biscayne Boulevard and uh, right by Bicentennial or well, used to be Bicentennial Park, near Bayside and all that. You see these luxurious, you see these luxurious pigeonholes, man. They're like high stories high, blocking the great some of the beautiful landmarks in the city of Miami. Freedom Tower is one of them. Just give you an example. It's happening everywhere. It's insane. And the, and a lot of areas like I see I see these fancy hotel fancy um places that built along Fort Lauderdale Beach. They're destroying the mangroves and the sea oaks. Yeah. So if a flood if a, if a big wave happens or a flood, forget it, man. It's gonna be like get your canoes, get your airboats. You know, we'll get our airboats go out there. That's how, that's how bad it could be. It's not global warming. It's called it's called um. Non-conforming, non-conforming progress. When I say that, they want to, they're altering the land instead of conforming with it. As a good example, Salt Lake City, I'm seeing them building mount, homes on mountains. They're shaving the, the land up to put the home on there. And it will happen a couple years ago, uh, a, a, a city in um, a home like that in North Salt Lake, it got um, mudslide and boom, crashed into a few homes, got destroyed. You don't mess with Mother Nature, plain and simple. And this is funny because all these financial backings, money laundering, they're building these big fancy homes. You know, what I say a lot of those. Homes, I see a lot of these facilities are not really fully occupied. It's time to use it. To it's time. To, I can think the people occupy occupy movement. Let's go in and start squatting in those places. Start squatting. Get solar. Get like green energy, solar power energy, heat, cow blue, water machines. Yeah, man, we, we can use it. <laughs> what the hell? We can make, we can create bathtubs as long as the sewage is all good. We can make things happen. Why not? Have have fun with that. But the one thing that for sure is it's just really insane. 
we don't know how we gotta see how accurate this really is. That's what you gotta really look at about the whole Panama Papers. But um, let's see how accurate, see how far the rabbit hole goes. You know what? But it's, it's interesting. It's all, like I said, I know the big trend on this on this report, but I just wanna, that's why I haven't really gonna go ape 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 crap on it because don't really need it. It's nothing to really think about, like how accurate this is, is and but we all know thing. We we'll know one thing: they're building these, like I said, luxurious pigeonholes, but we don't need. All right, so um, I'm gonna be done with that. Next one came out today from AntiWar.com. Sixth anniversary of WikiLeaks collateral murder: a celebration of free speech, by Nozami Hayase. Hey, Hayase. It says here, on April 5th, 2010, WikiLeaks published a classified, classified military footage of t- July 2007 attack by U.S. Army helicopter gunship in the Iraqi suburb of New Baghdad. Video titled Collateral Murder depicted in the killings of more than a dozen men, including two Reuters staffers. There's a video on that, too, so you check that out. And, and at the time of the release, WikiLeaks website temporarily crashed with a, ma- with a, ma- a massive influx of visitors while versions of popped up on YouTube. Reaching millions. The importance of the collateral murder video has been has often been talked about in the perspective that it provided visual evidence of uncounted U.S. military power and brutality. Now, on the sixth anniversary of its publication, we will visit the emergence of the, of the WikiLeaks in the public consciousness and explore the significance of the this video release for the advocacy of free speech and reflecting of this back, back groundbreaking public debut. Journalist Greg Mitchell noted. Now, WikiLeaks has fully arrived as a concept, as an organization, as a media fixture in America. Along with the apparent war crime, the uncensored images of modern war alerted people to the lack of government transparency and stifling a free speech in the very country that claimed to hold a torch of such things. Oh, yeah. Can't argue with that. And it could proceed here. The former U.S. service, former U.S. Foreign Service employee, Peter Van Buren pointed to several fronts where the government has assaulted the First Amendment. Examples including the weakening of the Freedom of Information Act that was originally created in 1966, the gutting of whistleblower protection, along with the recent unprecedented crackdown of truth tellers. In fact, this WikiLeaks publication revealed this trend by using the Freedom of Information Act. Ruse attempted to obtain the, the footage of these airstrikes from the U.S. Army with no success, and it wasn't until WikiLeaks WikiLeaks released collateral murder that they were able to access this information regarding the killing of their journalists. The censoring of images, smothering of free speech has cost the public access to the real images of images of war. Back in the 1960s during the Vietnam War, pictures of wounded soldiers and disciplines flooded through televisions into American homes. Unlike the current situation, the government has not yet learned to keep the press out of war zones where all could see the horrific images of what, in many cases, amounted to war crimes. Brazilian educator Paulo Ferreri, 1970, described the two, ty- two types of words as to opposing forces. Human existence cannot be silent, he wrote, nor it can be nursed by false words, but only by true words, with which men transform the world. That's page 76. These honest images of war were true words that have immense power to alter reality. Indeed, a sensational AP photograph of a naked Vietnamese girl running with her body burnt by a U.S. napalm attack that got onto the front page of every newspaper outraged the American people contributing to ending that war. Now these images are crucified to the crosshairs of the corporate media lens and government control. They are being blocked or turned into snapshots that conveniently carried one-sided official uh, narratives with crimes covered up by euphemisms. The WikiLeaks publication of this 2007 aerial footage lifted the gate of public perception that had been tightly guarded through secrecy and media manipulation. The video opened with a quote from George Orwell, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give the appearance of solid solidity. Solidity to pure win. Transcripts within footage of presented facts about the inc- incident on the morning of July 12, 2017, 2007, 
two Apache helicopters using 30 millimeter cannon fire killed about a dozen people in the Iraqi suburb of New Baghdad. Two children were also wounded. Although some of the men appear to have been armed, behavior of nearly everyone was relaxed. In a narrative file that quoted the U.S. Army's response to the attack, stated all the dead were anti-Iraqi forces or insurgents. And there is a fire truck. Yes, I am outside. It's nice and cloudy in Fort Lauderdale. But it's a um, nice cool breeze, too. Not No one's sweating. But you still get a suntan, by the way, because the cloud's like a magnifying glass. All right. I will proceed. What was brought to life on this grotesque image of horrific death was a voice of dissident, dissent, which until that time was suppressed by institutional hierarchy. This was the voice of whistleblower Chastity Manning. One moment. Some of these guys are going deaf. Good grief. Who was sentenced to 35 years in prison for releasing the largest trove of secret documents in U.S. history. At her pre-trial hearing in 2013, Manny spoke out about the fact regarding the incident in New Baghdad in her own words after identifying the second engagement in the video of an unarmed bongo truck taking the kids to school and the attitudes of the soldiers in the helicopter as the most alarming aspect of the video. She described it as seemingly delightful bloodlust, and it noted it appeared to be similar to a child torturing ants with a magnifying glass. Blips and words of radio distortion slowly occupied silence. Images that were freed began to move momentarily, intercepted by a still slide of official lines so viewers would engage critically with the pain, plain, colorist scenery shot from an Apache helicopter gun sight. Permission to engage. This previously unreleased video footage called to all witness, to witness the everyday life of brutal military occupation of Iraq and the 17-minute film. We were all given opportunity to see with our own eyes those, those uh, who those labeled as enemies. The war on terror really were a group of adults and children trying to defend themselves from being shot and journalists risking their lives to do, to do their job. At the same time, it invited Americans to see, them, see themselves and their roles and scenery in the scenery unfolding in a distant land. In an interview with Rafi Kachadorian the, of the New Yorker, WikiLeaks editor-in-chief Julian Assad described how before deciding on the title collateral murder, he had considered naming the short film commentary film permission to engage this video with transcript and a package of supporting documents released on april 5th 2012 provided the claim by u.s military authorities that the actions of the soldiers and pilots involved were in accordance with the law of armed conflict and its own rules of engagement the radio transmission audio catches the line of ruthless weaponry when voices of the copter crew came through yeah, Bushmasters. Yet yeah, we have a van that appro that's approaching and picking up the bodies. Let me engage. Can I shoot? Roger. Break. Oh, Crazy Horse. One eight. Request permission to engage. Picking up the wounded. Yeah, we're trying to get permission to engage. Come on, let us shoot. The carnage enacted in this raw footage calls us to question these rules of engagement and most importantly. Who gives these soldiers permission to engage in such airstrikes, killing civilians in countries that are clearly no threat to the U.S.? Militaries that operate under the nation-state premise are said uh, to act on behalf of the interests of their people. In the case of the U.S. military, the president acts as a commander-in-chief for the entire army. So ultimately, he granted an aerial weapons team permission to engage the van and the square with open fire to murder in the name of God and country government based on the idea of consent of governing requires informed citizens and for this unfiltered information is critical for people to make informed decisions those who govern with overclassification of information and dismantling of basic free press have been keeping citizenry in the dark and preventing them from participating in these vital decisions WikiLeaks, as a creative application on the Internet, has enabled the right of the people to speak free, freely speak. Speech ha that challenges authority. Speech that questions its legitimacy, especially when it acts, such an act has become so dangerous. Through Manning's brave act of conscience, 
a lost image was resurrected. True words from which ordinary men and women everywhere can transform the world. This made it possible for people to engage in determining the legitimacy of authority and begin withdrawing consent whenever necessary. Soon after the video release, S.M. McCord, one of the soldiers on the ground at the scene of the shooting, came forward to write an apology letter to the Iraqi people. With heavy hearts, two former soldiers from the Army unit expressed their deep sorrows and wished to repair the damage the country has caused. Iceland, the collaborators of the video released travel to Baghdad to meet the family, vic, fam, the family of the victims of this attack to seek for justice. Debate and discussion that was sparked began to dissolve apathy and callous disregard, replacing it with genuine interest and concern for others. In the eyes of many, this video has this video to be seen as having turned the tide of the war in Iraq. Now. Of the sixth year in the sixth year anniversary, let us celebrate the publication of Collateral Murder as a historic renewal of free speech. In 2010, on the, the day after Easter Sunday, the act of posting such a video online instigated the, a free flow of information on either giving an everlasting effect of letting people see the other side of the story, and that had been buried by official narrative. This iconic. Iconic film continues to remind us of those who risked their lives for free press and also the power of free speech. That our collective engagement with the truth can frozen images set, can set frozen images into motion by seizing the present. Can we can intervene in the course of the one fatal day and alter the running footage of the past, bringing each person one step closer to self determination on their own future. This was. Originally reprinted from Common Dreams. So you cannot argue with that, my friends. This is why I was against the Iraq war in general. I understand the friendship bases, but who benefits? It's imperialism. That's all it is. One world order. And of course, Jorge um, W. Bush or Wuss Bush. I call him a Wuss anyway because he is another Wuss ass bellboy. Just an example. So, oh, we gotta, we gotta rescue, we gotta rescue Iraq from the hands of Saddam Hussein. Now, I'm not a Saddam Hussein supporter by any means, but you know what? Saddam, stop playing the game. That's what happened. During that time, I was at a place called San Loco in downtown Fort Lauderdale. We're all hanging out. I think it was Taco Tuesdays, I believe it was. And George Bush, W. Bush, talked about we're gonna attack Iraq, the war in Iraq. I just called him. Criticize his ass, go piss on your imperial sways, you son of a bitch. You know, that's that's how what I said. Everyone, people that knew me, start laughing because they understand where I'm coming from. It's all in the name of principle. This is why I condemn these wars, and there's some good people even fought, and they suffered from it as well. I have a good friend of mine that um, in the graphic design business. Talk about um, Desert Storm, and I was, when I was in Mars down in Kendall Mars Bar, everyone told me how great he is, how they kicked ass. He didn't want to talk about it because he said a lot. Of, he, he, a lot of his good friends passed because of that. Well, for, for what? Yeah, you know? they don't know what they're fighting for technically. That's a, and that's why the declaration of war has to be done honorably, not attack another country on an imperialistic matter. That's what happened in Iraq and other places, and it happened it's going on in Libya as well. You know, with the whole NATO thing and the so-called humanitarian effort, and all Obama supporters didn't, didn't protest. Why is that? Because they're a bunch of damn hypocrites. Just an example. I am digressing on that. And I do apologize. But folks, the video links on the the video the the links on there. And you get when you on the article, so you can read. You see the link. See the video yourself. I've seen it so many times. Makes my blood boil. I still get pissed off at the world, but I don't let my anger control me. I may get infuriated, but I learn to be productive. So I learn to counter it. I may I may have my moments, but then I boom, I know what to do. It's more of an inspiration than just blowing smoke. But gotta protect free speech, freedom of the press, not just the United States, but the world. If you don't like it, get out.
Not have a sign that says, I'm a tyrannical butt lug. That's enough of that. I'm going to take a little breather for a moment and stick around. All right. Yep. So I'm just back here. And um, just to let you know, I did. I am going to add the Bush and Hitler connection on the, which was an interview with um, John Buchanan, who was an investigative journalist. Did talk about, did ex expose on archival facts about the Bush Nazi connection. So I'm going to add that with the whole next uh, Bush war criminal thing. So um, just to give you guys a heads up, and that's going to be the add that to the link. So this is um next thing I want to be doing came from the Christian Today. It says here demonic arches rising in New York and London on April 19th. Welcome signs for the Antichrist. And it says here the uh, about the runes at the Temple of Baal in Palmyra, Syria, are seen in the still image of an undated video taken from a social media website on March 24, 2016, which is fine because I know the whole thing, I did talk about the whole thing that's going on in Syria when the Syrian uh, forces got back that town, which is a ancient ancient community, by the way. So it's interesting about the whole Temple of Baal is in that area. But we'll continue on here. It says, Christians should watch out for two events that will take place simultaneously on April 19th in New York City and London. Christian author Michael Snyder said, Michael Snyder has a thing called a collapse, uh, economic collapse dot blog. Dot com. So definitely check him out. He's, he's really good on information. Regardless of what your faith is, he got, he got some great information. So um, I will proceed here. On that day, reproductions of the arch stood in front of the Temple of Baal in Palmyra, Syria, are going to be erected in Times Square and in Trafalgar Square. That will coincide with an occult festival related to the worship of the demon named Baal. Writing for the Charisma News, a Snyder wanders Rather, the arches to be installed would be a giant welcome sign for the Antichrist. Although also said his fears are based on these facts. On April 19th is the first day of the 13-day period of time known as the blood sacrifice to the beast that culminates in the high occult holy day of Valente on May 1st, he says. April 19th is also the day of the Feast of Moloch, an ancient Canaanite god that is repeatedly vilified in the Old Testament. Of course, the Bohemian Grove, too. They beam me and grow. They talk about the whole thing of, of Moloch as well on the um, cremation of care. So definitely check that out. All right. Snyder also notes a a series of horrific events that occurred on April 19th. And which these are facts. Okay. It's just some examples. It says here, April 19th, 1993, Waco massacre. An FBI assault that led to the burning down of the compound on the sec named Branch of Indian, killing 76 men, women, and children. Of course, they had to put the ATF flag too. Uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, on, the, on the remnants of that uh, Mount Carmel facility, uh, property. Uh, April 19, 1995, Oklahoma City bombing. 168 people killed. April 20, 1999, Columbine High School massacre. 13 people murdered and 21 injured. April 16, 2007, Virginia Tech massacre. Killed, 32 killed, 17 injured. April 16, Boston Marathon explosion. 3 killed, 107 injured. April 19, Boston terrorist, Tamlis, Zarnev shot to death. Snyder also notes that 2016 is a leap year. April 20th will be the 11th, 111th day of the year, and the triple numbers are considered to be the power dates in the occult world. He says the worship of Baal can be traced all the way back on the ancient king of Babylon that is known in Syrian, Sumerian sources as Enemakar, but that is known in the Bible as Nimrod. Nimrod established the very first New World Order in the ancient world, and he fundamentally changed the course of human history. After he died, the ancient king of Babylon eventually came to be worshipped as a sun god under different names, Marduk, Osiris, and Apollo, among others. Many secret societies and occult groups believe that someday this ancient deity will be resurrected and will once again take his place as the ruler of the world. Moreover, many Christian scholars believe that there is a connection between Nimrod and the coming Antichrist. Snyder wonders, is just a coincidence that we are erecting arches from this ancient deity in London, New York and London on that date is exceedingly significant for those that worship this ancient deity. Could it be possible that there is no more, there is more to these gateways that are being constructed that we are being told? The author notes 
that mankind has entered a period of time known in the Bible as the, quote, last days, unquote. From this point forward, things are going to get much and much stranger. Ultimately, the world that we live in is going to come to resemble something out of a post-apocalyptic science fiction novel, Snyder warns. I'm not going to say it's set in stone, my friend. Or I am want to be preaching the choir or preaching the Bible by any means. I'm not anti-Bible or anti-Christian. But I do examine things pretty damn thoroughly by many other references. What's this um, common, what they, what they have in common, common ground or common interest. You got to really pay attention about the one world order. And sometimes they, these oligarchs, okay, voivods. Because I call them voivods and vampires and voivods. They manifest over this. And what happened was on April 19th that week, a lot of things happened, even way back when. You just like you got a real look. You look look at the dates. I, I think I did I did one on April 19th a couple years uh, a couple years ago, 2014. Yeah, very strange stuff. Like things happen on September 11th as well. Strange stuff happened on that particular date. Of course, what happened in Pennsylvania, New York, and the Pentagon in Virginia. Of, of course, Operation Condor in Chile. And don't, don't forget, September, uh, September Dawn, which Brigham Young was responsible for killing, uh, massacring a bunch of folks in Utah. You know, like there were Mormons, like there was some Mormon rivalry. So it's very interesting. And the, but funny because they, they banned that movie. The movie about it, they banned it in, that, in the Beehive State. But now, the uh, recently, a few years ago, the... Um, Temple, the folks from Temple Square of the, the Church of Latter-day Saints admit it that happened, which is wow. So, a lot of, shit, a lot of stuff is getting exposed. But the whole thing, you get, folks, you gotta do is always pay attention. Even around these times, you gotta look at everything thoroughly. So, it's gonna be fact is stranger than fiction. And like I said, you don't have to believe in the scriptures and all that, but always pay attention. We just gotta wait and see. But having those little arcs from Palmyra, Temple of Baal, April 19th, New York and London. Remember about New York and London? They're part of the Strong Seas Network. One World Order, right? New World Order 101. Something to really contemplate, my friends. So um, let's just give you my let's give you my little view. You gotta make that own. You gotta make your own judgment. But always pay attention and prepare yourselves at all costs. Even tell us to your friends. Lovers, enemies, etc. All right. This one here is pretty interesting. Came from Washington Times. Ray Lewis. What the hell? Talk about football players and all that. Ray Lewis had a video on here. It says here, Ray Lewis rips Black Lives Matter movement for ignoring black on black crime. A Facebook video of former Baltimore Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis criticizing the Black Lives Matter movement for ignoring black on black crime has gone viral. I'm trying to figure out if black lives really matter. An emotional Mr. Lewis said in a video posted on his personal page Saturday, the murder rate rate rose by 20 percent, but we're not rioting in the streets over black on black crime. I'm trying to figure out in my mind why no one is paying attention to black men killing black men. He continued. Why do we always find ourselves as the victims? And now we have we have the separation once again that we're being victimized because of one bad white cop, two bad white cops, three bad white cops killing a young black brother. But every day we have black on black crime killing each other. I know black lives matter because I am a black man. But man, stop killing each other. Man, we got to put these guns down in Chicago, Baltimore, Miami. Man, it ain't that hard. Got to be okay with earning a living. It ain't supposed to be easy, Mr. Lewis said. If we don't change, we're doing not only will our kids not have a future, but we might find ourselves extinct. As of yesterday afternoon, Mr. Lewis' video had been viewed more than 2.8 million times. This isn't the first time he called out the movement for focusing on the wrong issues. We're removing the black and say lives matter. Remove the word black and say lives matter, Mr. Lewis said in September, BET reported. Stop spent sending mothers back home empty. You can never replace a mother's child. 
If you want Black Lives Matter, let it make it matter to us. That's the new call. So I have a feeling some of the, some of the group may call him an Uncle Tom, an Oreo. I don't. And I've seen him play. I remember him from University of Miami. Great linebacker. When he got drafted by the Baltimore Ravens, he got, what, two, three uh, Super Bowl rings? He was a great player. But you know what? You cannot knock him. Hatred, killing, murders is happening a lot. I know crime's down, but people got to think twice. That's what he's saying. It's a lot more than just black-white thing. That's, that's an old, that's an old um, Edward Nation's playbook called Propaganda. Black on white crime. Black cop killed a, a white cop killed a black cop. A black person. Oh my goodness. Let's all go out and rally. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. We're, we're organic. No, we're not. We're corporate funded, but we're not going to tell you. This is what they want. This is what's so disturbing about these certain movements. That's why I don't really jump on these high horses. I'm out there. I call them out. I examine things. But what Mr. Lewis has to say, I cannot blame him. We cannot use hatred towards one another. We have to start thinking as beautiful human beings. We all have our moments. We all have to use force if necessary. Self-defense. Nothing to argue about that. But many people, they, they want to go shooting over garbage, the war on drugs, they, um, um, and, and other petty stuff. Someone farted. Or you look at my girlfriend funny. I'm going to shoot you. Come on. Blow that guy a kiss, will you? Laugh at him. Get Don't get mad. Get inspired. Yeah, I walked around with the you know, nice looking ladies around the block, you know, in my time. I see people whistling. I'm like, thank you, buddy. I got good taste. Something to think about, my friends. And this is what I think is what I find disturbing because people's uh, morality is not really the same. And we are all capable of bringing that back up. Like you said before, we can empower ourselves, improve our lives, our dignity our human nature as a whole. And I do agree with him. Lives do matter. And I remember people protesting in, in Mobile, Alabama. Doesn't matter what they look at. All went side by side. Say all lives matter. All lives matter. Because people do care. One thing about Black Lives Matter is it's another example of a mind control movement funded by big multinational corporations. Look it up. I talked about it before. And it's just a shame. And this is why I always say about these movements, you got to make sure it's organic. I've learned this for a long time. When I see some scripted crap, I call these people out or I just laugh at them. But that's what they earned. Because they're just doing it for their own personal gain. Me, not being arrogant or pretentious, I try to do everything for the bigger cause. As far as I'm concerned, we got bigger fish to fry, my friends. Stop killing each other. Respect one another. Get off all this garbage is in our systems. Got to tell the drug lords to stick it up their behinds. They don't care about you. That's why I say end the confounded drug war. It's a monumental lie. We start doing that. And things, can, everyone can spiritually prosper. That's how I see about what I see about what Mr. Ray Lu, Raymond Lewis has to say. I would just do thank him for that too. But it was nicely done. All right, finally, this came from originally from the Daily Beast. Cato put it out. Actually, it was March 30th, and um, the Daily Beast put this out. Cato republished it. It says here, The Great Wall of Trump would be an ultimate intimate domain horror show. I like what it says here. What Donald Trump doesn't want you to know about his plan to build a great wall between U.S. and Mexico, he needed to steal private property from Americans to build it. In 2013, federal government succeeded in using intimate domain to require the land rights to build a former fence across Dr. Elzea's G. Temez's ancestral home in 2013. Dr. Temez's land has been in her family since the King of Spain granted it them in 1767. 
but it's the rest of the U.S.-Mexican border. So the Department of Homeland Security took it to erect a border under a new federal law, under a federal law enacted during the Bush administration. The Great Wall of Trump would mean hundreds, if not thousands, of temezes. What Donald Trump doesn't want you to know about his plan to build a Great Wall between the U.S. and Mexico, he needs... Oh, sorry about that. It's like, same thing here. Sorry. In the words of the Don, of, Don, of the Donald, the border is 2,000 miles, but we really need 1,000 miles of walls. The 1,000-mile disparity suggests that Trump would incorporate existing walls and natural boundaries. In 2006, Congress passed the Secure Fence Act, calling for no less than 700 miles and no less to be constructed on vulnerable points of the 1,954-mile U.S.-Mexican border. Completed segment segments of that project plus a natural boundaries could reasonably make it so only 1,000 miles of actual wall building is necessary. Yet, it carried it, it carried out Congress 2006 wall construction mandate. Department of Homeland Security hit a snag. Real estate issues were causing significant delay, according to its Inspector General, and that makes perfect sense. Recall Dr. Temez, her comment con- condemnation case instigated in 2008 only closed last year a few days shy of seven years the, the government accountability office reports pdf the pdf from federal and tribal lands make up 632 miles or approximately 33 percent of the nearly 2,000 total border miles of what of the remaining 66 percent private and state-owned lands constitute the remaining 67 percent of the border most of which is texas loca- located in texas this means that if Trump's plan to build another 1,000 miles wall is carried to fruitation, 1,000 more homeowners will see their property destroyed or partially walled off. Indeed, during construction of the secure fence in 2008, to actually finish the 370-mile of pedestrian fencing that Homeland Security plan required, negotiating purchases and voluntary sales for more than 480 landowners, and filing common con- condemnation cases. Where those negotiations broke down again, according to DHS's Inspector General, whose report Dry Lie notes that acquiring real property from non federal owners is a costly, time consuming process requiring negotiations and sometimes condemnation. If the first 700 miles built in from the Bush era mandates took over a decade to legitimate eminent domain case like Temez's and affected nearly 500 owners, homeowners. Trump's 35-foot wall and 1,000-mile-long monstrosity will take at least as many. The federal government has a good portion of its land already in the Bush administration construction. The fence built so far extends to Texas, which is, which, as the image below shows, means it mostly costs, covers land it was already federally owned. Trump's new fencing would be built primarily on state-owned and private lands. So Trump has a long history of using eminent domain to his benefit as a private citizen and intends to use it as a president to take land from American property owners. Eminent domain is certainly contemplated by the Constitution, but under the Fifth Amendment, the federal government would be on the hook for providing just compensation to all these property owners. That would be quite expensive for the taxpayer to say that the least. Moreover, there is gross impropriety, propriety, in taking hundreds of people's lands, including Native American burial grounds, where construction pursuant to, to the secure fence that has already left human remains hanging off of the machinery used to build the wall. Even as that wall is widely recognized as an effective solution to immigration and drug trade issues. America deserves better than half-baked notions about futile great walls that will only result in decades of condemnation proceedings and pain for American homeowners and taxpayers. One can only pray that Trump supporters will eventually care about these issues and hold their leader responsible for specific, reasonable plans. Yep. So everyone's manifesting over the Great Wall. Who's going to benefit? That's the thing I really look at. That's why I don't go around following the hype and the hoopla of Donald Trump. Like I said, he has some good points, it's fine, but you always got to look at the fine line. It's going to be very costly to the taxpayers. Guarantee that. Because look what happened with the whole uh, Fence Act, Fence Security Act. Taking too much time, 
costing people money. That's how it is. So don't believe in the hoopla of this great wall. I say this, stop the benefits for the illegals. Okay, this is getting frivolous. Fiscal responsibility. And you know what? Then they'll think twice. The people in Mexico, for example, a lot of them are great folks. A lot of them are fighting back against their tyranny in that country. I give them the thumbs up. You got to get that place going. Fascism is really running, running a rampant in south of us, south of the border. And that's a real shame because a lot of beautiful people live out, live in those areas, are being shafted. They got their homes, their farmland, their property seized by those vultures and shipped them to the cities. This is why, come to tyranny, I defy it all, regardless of some economic structure. And Mr. Trump, you better back it up. But a lot of us know, I, I, know, I am familiar with your inmate domain practices in New Jersey as well. It's not being a prima donna, just keep it real. People are trying, trying to push for you, endorse you, and all that. But you know, I'm not going to jump on any hype and hoopla. I'm not really endorsing the man either. But I'm not going to vote for the guy because lesser two evils or anything like that. But this great wall is easier said than done, my friends. And we got to go back to our Constitution. Limited federal government. That would be a lot better than running amok. And I understand the whole North American Union. That has to be shared. It's got to, we got to obliterate that, that referendum as well. I'm not going to just hurt the American people. But the Canadians and Mexican brothers and sisters as well. And it's how I see things. And um, that is it on those. And I'm going to be playing a song called Jekyll Island by Sons of Liberty, which is a uh, project from um, John Schaefer. He has a band called Ice Earth. So it's a really good song. I heard it, heard it a while back. A lot of what's going on with the wars and so forth, the Federal Reserve, mainly about the Federal Reserve and um, how it started. But definitely, I want to play this before. I'd like to say to everyone, thank you for listening. Plus, feel free to share this and download ep- this episode throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, love letters, hate letters, compliments, criticisms, or you got something I could check out, that'd be great. However, please send those comments with decorum. I know many of you have, which is great, and I thank you for it. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, YouTube, the Freedom Network, and Scene.Life. Or you can email me at LokiLuck3, number three is all together, at gmail.com. Like I said before, once again, thank you for your time. But always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves, keep on spreading the love, and may your guardian spirits be with you. Enjoy the song.
the American people allow private banks to control the issuance of their currency, first by inflation and then by deflation. The banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs>